Hi, and welcome to Digital Hygiene for Defense Lawyers, a Digital Security Checklist. I'm Jumana Musa with the Fourth Amendment Center here at NACDL. And we brought this program to you today because the way in which we need to manage clients' information has changed considerably. It used to be that you just kept your files locked, you didn't have conversations in coffee shops, and you could protect privilege. But the way we work today, we have so many digital devices, we have digital files, we have Alexa, who's a snitch, and may <laughs> talk to somebody about what you're doing and who you're talking to. And so in order to think about these things holistically, in order to comply with your ethical obligations and protect your client's information, you need to think hard about your digital security, about your files, about your networks, about you know what devices might be listening while you're having client conversations. So what we've done today is we have brought Matt Mitchell, who is the Director of Digital Safety and Privacy for Tactical Tech. He's a hacker, and he also serves as an advisor on the Fourth Amendment Center's Tech Advisory Board. So without further ado, I'm gonna leave it to Matt to talk to us about our digital security. Hi everyone, I'm Matt Mitchell, and I wanna thank you for taking the time out to attend this webinar, and for those of you in the room to attend it in person. Of course, there's not enough time of the day for the work that we do. However, this, these best practices and this checklist will enable you to know that you've done some due diligence when it comes to digital safety and digital hygiene. Okay, great. So, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, I don't know how to use a pointer thing. Am I going forward? I'm going forward. I'm going forward. That's okay. We'll just keep going forward. I think it slowed down. That's what you say, but that's not what I'm having. It's my, not my experience. Grammarly I don't know what that does is. more than catch errors. So with Grammarly, you can find really good, no, perfect words that make your writing sharp. Yeah. Or it, explicit so what we're going to do while we fix this little technical issue here As a matter is of fact, um, what it's worth. Grammarly can you can think of yeah, digital hygiene long. a lot like physical hygiene. And this while good. everyone at the and law this. firm or everyone well, who's working with you as a um, defense attorney or everyone who's with you as a, um, you know, who, who's in like your office or your space with you might have different levels of physical hygiene. We all use the same doorknob, right? And if one person doesn't wash their hands after going to the bathroom, then we're all touching that doorknob, we're all gonna like, basically hit that low level of hygiene. Digital hygiene works the same way, where it, regardless of where you might consider yourself on the spectrum of understanding uh, all these digital tools and how to properly protect um, confidentiality and um, ethics and privilege, it's important that everyone around you has a certain baseline. So I'm gonna talk about what that baseline should be. So for some of you who consider yourselves very well versed in these things, it's important to pull out a pen and a pad and work on this checklist with me. Okay. Let's see. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do that and then you're you're gonna move it. Can you do that? Okay, great. Yeah. All right. So let's continue while they work out this um, work out this stuff. Uh, I'm Matt Mitchell. I'm a hacker. Um, there's a hacker TV show called Mr. Robot, and on the show, there um, as a shout out to me, they put some Matt Mitchell stuff into my projects in there, which is really nice. And um, I'm quite a few things. I work with an organization. Um, let's try. It. Okay. Let's, okay, great. So I work with an organization called uh, GGS Security, which is a private security firm that um, helps people who are working in um, hostile environments or conflict zones. This might be an uh, activist, this might be an NGO worker, it might be a journalist. And what they do is they replicate hostile environments so you know what it's like. They believe in a thing called stress-induced learning. Um, how will you best know how to protect a colleague who gets hit by a bullet if we don't simulate that? Uh, so they have actors and Hollywood blood and all kinds of effects and they try to bring you to that moment. Whatever your natural response is, it's incorrect, right? Whether you freeze or run or 
cry or try to make jokes and they bring you back to who you are and then they give you a map on how to respond and that's what I do with them is the uh, digital side of that um, it's one thing to understand that we should probably be securing our laptops or computers it's another thing to see what an infected computer looks like to uh, look at a computer whose webcam is taken over from another computer where you can see what's going on on, on that other side and it really cements the knowledge okay let's move on I also work with a group called Tactical Tech uh, Tactical Technology Collective is a Berlin, Germany-based NGO that teaches folks about the um, dark side of technology. They have a thing called exposingtheinvisible.org, um, and they have a thing called theglassroom.org, which is a pop-up store that's going to be set up in San Francisco, and uh, they try to educate the public as well as create completely free Creative Commons open source information for anyone to take and they translate it in many different languages. And in my job there's making sure all the information is correct. Okay, so you can see this exposing the invisible, the kit. Please uh, check that out. If you have a copy of the slides, um, you can just try to look this stuff up. The data detox kit are is very simple steps you can take like a health detox to get better at di digital hygiene. And this is just for a general audience information. You can share that with friends or family, and you also can go through it yourself. Uh, but this conversation is going to focus on our professional work as lawyers. I also used to be a journalist at a newspaper, but um, I'm not there anymore because I decided to do this work to have more impact. Okay, okay let's keep going. Oh, let's go. Can we go back? Let's see if we can. Oh, that's okay. We're just gonna just kind of keep it, keep it moving. I think we've been hacked. I think that's what happened. You know, <laughs> they didn't want you to have this information, so just bear with us because we're gonna make sure you get it. Okay. All right. Keep going. Keep going. In, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip through some slides. Uh, they're just me talking about how awesome I am. So you can check them out later. Let's go back one slide if possible. Okay, great. So, um, one of the things that's important is you probably wouldn't be talking about a client's uh, particular case file, what's going on with them, what happened in your last interview or meeting in a crowded elevator. That might be considered something that would be not ethically perfect, right? And um, when you talk about attorney-client privilege and you talk about your uh, responsibility for confidentiality that we all have when it comes to legal defense, it wouldn't be good if we talked about what's going on with our client on a crowded uh, public transit like a bus or a train. But we are doing that when we speak in front of these devices. Uh, whether that be a smartphone or whether that be one of these like home assistants, uh, a lot of people don't realize that home assistants like Amazon Alexa or Google Home and um, even like Apple products, to keep quality assurance high, the quality team can jump into and do jump into any device and just listen to what's going on. They check uh, some metrics to make sure the, the wake words like OK Google are working correctly. And they also check the acoustics of that product. And it's something that you opt into by agreeing to the terms of service. But if you have this product in your uh, law office or in a conference room, you already can see where it can be problematic. There are cases where, um, in one case, Amazon employees in Romania listened on what they thought was a domestic disturbance and didn't know whether they should call law enforcement or not. And we're trying to figure that out by talking to the manager at a call center. So um, yes, and uh, you, know, you can read more about this stuff in Bloomberg, Washington Post, and uh, Mercury News. The headlines are all there, Wired, et cetera. But it's just something to stress. Uh, the very first thing on your checklist is look around your room. If there's a home assistant, in the office, that means that there's a lot of people in that office. If that's a conference room, if that's a place where a, conf uh, a confidential conversation is going to happen, remove the home assistant. If you do not need your smartphone at this exact moment, leave it outside of the room and re return to just pen and paper. Uh, it's just the, the easiest way to like, just rule out any problems when it comes to confidentiality, all right? Okay. Now, it's important to understand that hackers know no laws and no lands. So what is legal and what is right does mean, it means nothing to hackers. Uh, this is a page from WikiLeaks. If you go to WikiLeaks' website, uh, you could look up Sony emails. Not all of them, because the entire company was hacked, but just the one that WikiLeaks thought were the best. 
And if you type Esquire into that search or ESQ, you will find tons of confidential emails in plain text between attorneys and their clients. And of course, we will not do that because we will not want to be reading other people's emails, but they're on the public internet and they're searchable. That block of text that says, uh, you know, after your email, this email is confidential and it's, you know, between me and this person and you can get sued, that means nothing to someone who can easily access and grab your email. And, uh, you know, any lawyer who worked at Sony wishes that they had greater protections and they attended a webinar like this one. Okay. Another thing that's important to understand is that the platforms all work with prosecutors, but they do not work with the defense. Every platform has a front door for law enforcement and prosecution that you will not be able to access. If you were able to uh, get someone uh, a reprieve or maybe like a double look at maybe some weird piece of evidence, then, or maybe there, you can prove that this person never spoke to that person because they have a message log in Facebook, you're not going to be able to subpoena these uh, tech firms to get this content. And when you are making these requests, it's very, very difficult. But if you go to facebook.com slash records, like the vinyl spinning records, law enforcement online request form. All you got to do is put in your email address. If that domain name is a globally well-known law enforcement agency like nypd.gov or, you know, uh, Scotland Yard or whatever, right, UK, UK, you'll get an email that says, hey, uh, what information do you need? What's their Facebook profile? Do you want pictures? Do you want chat logs? Do you want information that's not shared? you know, to everyone, but they did enter in Facebook, and we will produce it for you, right? On Google, there's something called lers.google.com, which is a law enforcement request form for Google, where you can say, hey, do you want to know not just what this person typed into a search engine and when they typed it, but maybe you want to know if Google has any location data on that person, right? So all of these things are, again, not in our hands, but in the hands on the other side, the other, other council. And it's important for us to understand that. The platforms create a whole, they kind of, it's a game changer, the amount of data that they have, how quickly they can search and access it, right? Okay. Also, you know, uh, when it comes to law enforcement, security forces, FBI, local law enforcement, regardless, it doesn't matter, the rules have changed. And because of something, for example, um, a federal prosecution rule 41, which says that prosecutors um, can make a request for uh, the government to, to investigate via hacking themselves, right? So, and this used to be something that you would, uh, let's say I'm in New York or I'm in New Jersey or I'm in California, I had to find a federal judge in my area who's going to say, yes, this can go through, we're going to give you a warrant to um, investigate using electronic means. Right? But now this can be any judge on a, uh, so you can go judge shopping. You can find a particular judge in a particular jurisdiction that will approve this request, and then you can go there regardless of where this uh, alleged crime may have um, taken place, right? And so now what we have are police hackers who work um, to investigate evidence, and the amount of data that they're accessing is a very large amount. Sometimes it's very hard to be surgical and just get one piece of data that was listed in the warrant, and you end up with a huge amount of data and this is something, again, that we need to look out for, and we're going to talk more about. Next slide. Okay. And of course, uh, we've all heard about things like um, algorithm, uh, algorithms and, um, you know, uh, analyzing different crime data and encryption and things like this. And, you know, more and more where we have our computers being assistant to uh, prosecutors uh, law enforcement, and even judges themselves when it comes to um, algorithms that try to help you decide how sed sentencing s should go. However, when we look at these things, we notice that the algorithms themselves are flawed. So we're in a new space that's different from before. How can we operate differently? Next slide. Okay, let's just move past that. Next slide. Okay. So the bad news is it is now your job you who are now attending this webinar, not your IT team, not the office geek, not a tech support help desk, uh, to know some of this stuff. I, I have no illusions that you're going to know everything from this presentation. What I ask you is to just leave with one piece of information that's new. And um, if your checklist just begins with removing the home assistant from our office when we're speaking, you've done a great deal. Okay? Let's move to the next one. Okay. So here's all the stuff we're going to learn today. It's crazy. 
So I want you to take a swig of your coffee, make sure your pen is writing, and buckle your seatbelt. OK, next slide. OK, next slide. Let's move through. Next slide. I'm just trying to pace. Sorry. OK, well, well let's go back. So um, to make these best practices part of a written down mandatory security policy and data retention policy is what I ask of you. And what that means is this is what you've written down as the way that you operate from now on with all clients, no matter what. No matter what, all clients, I'm going to tell them that they should create a ProtonMail email address, let's say. And that email address shouldn't have their personal information on it because, you know, part of confidentiality means no one needs to know that you're seeking legal assistance. And that's something that I universally tell all clients. And I encrypt everything the same way. And I keep all my emails for 10 days, regardless of what they are, whether they're, hey, uh, do you want to meet for coffee tomorrow, or whether it's um, someone trying to talk to me about a case. Right? And you want to have that as a policy, because you don't want to be um, accused of you know, having uh, wishy-washy policies, and some rules you apply sometimes. And it's best to have a universal, uniform, written down policy. So as you start taking these t um, steps into how you do things, make sure that you say, I now communicate over signal always on mobile. It's written down by me. We've made this decision that this is how I move forward. If I'm a public defender and I'm on a shared computer, I still say that this is my rule. I sign it, right? If I work with a small firm, if I work with a large firm, we work with our tech team and our legal team to decide what our data retention policy is and when do we erase stuff. And then we just say we're going to stick to this policy. Now, in reality, it's hard to stick to these policies, but it's good to have those rules and those rules that are always produced and always followed. All right, hope that makes sense. So let's move on. Let's move on. OK. Whoa, go back. Spoilers. OK. So what's the best way to secure your laptop or computer? I get this all the time. Hey, Matt, you know, I'm a lawyer, and I've got this laptop, and I use it every day. Most of my job is actually reading documents on a computer screen. I'm getting emails. I'm getting PDFs. I'm using different things on the web. And that's most of what I'm doing. Maybe I open up my Microsoft Word or Office, and I'm typing things in there. And if I'm at a legal proceeding, I'm involved in a case, there's tons of sensitive documents on this computer. How do I secure this computer? If you have not asked yourself this question, today's the day. You've got to slap yourself in the face and be like, why didn't I think of this? Okay. What is the answer? Thank you. I wish you can see uh, my lovely assistant here who is revealing these awesome answers. Thank you. OK. So Stethoscope. Stethoscope is a program that was developed by this company called Netflix. You probably watch a movie on Netflix or a TV show on Netflix. And they have a lot of high security there because there's a lot of licensing deals and proprietary technology. They needed a way that they can tell that every computer at Netflix had a baseline of security. Stethoscope, as we will use it, is available on this website, ragtag.org, and it's part of their digital privacy tools. So if you go to ragtag.org, you look at their digital privacy tools, you install Stethoscope on your PC or Mac. So what is Stethoscope? As you can see here, it's a creepy giraffe with a uh, medical stethoscope around its neck. I did not draw that thing. I don't know why that's the logo. And it will scan your computer and tell you hey, you need to turn on the VPN. And it tells you a little bit of what a VPN is and how that works, right? You need to turn on like how to encrypt your machine. And it tells you a little bit how what that is and tells you where that is on your machine, right? So a non-technical person is, should be able to download this program, install it on their computer, and it'll scan where you are. It'll show you a bunch of red X's or green check marks and explain how you get all green check marks. If you get all green check marks, you have secured your laptop or computer. All right? That simple. And if that's the only thing you get from this conversation, you're ahead of the curve. Most computers don't have full disk encryption turned on. That means that if you lose your laptop in a taxi cab or you leave it in a coffee shop, maybe someone breaks into your office and steals the laptop, they don't need your password. The password you type in every morning when you get into your laptop, that's just permission to use your operating system. But a hacker doesn't want permission to use the operating system. They just want the data, and the data is just laying all over the place. So without full disk encryption, it's game over. With full disk encryption, a turned off computer is completely locked down. And stethoscope, one of the first check marks is, is this computer full disk encrypted? Right? 
Next, what's the best secure email option? And when I say best, I mean in Matt's humble opinion, what's best, all right? And I will say it's ProtonMail. Why ProtonMail, right? What is ProtonMail? And what do I even mean by secure email? If you've ever sent a postcard, wish you were here, just got back from an Icelandic vacation, right? You'll realize that it's just a photo on one side and some words on the other side. And every postal carrier from Iceland to DC to San Francisco can just flip it over and read that message. And that's how email works. All email is plain text. And if you send it from myawesomelawfirm.gov or mygmailaccount.com to another domain name, it's going through the internet and every mailbox that it checks, every mail carrier, we call them mail exchanges, that it passes through gets a copy of that email. So how can we say that we're being private and confidential? Right? How can we say that we're respecting privilege when we're leaving copies of emails everywhere? Right? So to solve this problem, most services, when they send an email to someone who uses the same service, the email does not actually leave to the internet. So if I send you an email from gmail.com to another email at gmail.com, the Gmail emails just go from one side of Google servers to the other side of Google servers. And that is a good, safe way to secure that. And ProtonMail is a lot like Gmail. I can set up an account there, and I can send an email from protonmail.com user to another protonmail.com user. And it just goes from one side of the Proton mailbox to the other side of the Proton mailbox. So those of you who are caffeinated and have been following are probably thinking, well, why would I use ProtonMail instead of, let's say, Gmail to Gmail? And the answer is, Gmail has the keys to your inbox. They can be, uh, they can be, um, they can be served a, a warrant. They can be served a subpoena. They can be um, compelled to give up that key. And then your entire inbox is available to Gmail. And this has happened in the past. During a Department of Justice investigation on a WikiLeaks, um, suspected WikiLeaks member, Gmail fought it as best as they could, but their only option would have been shutting down Google, which is not going to happen. And so they served up an entire inbox full of emails. Right? And um, if you think that this doesn't happen in the, the NYPD um, in 2019 received some messages about a possible uh, school shooting or something in New Jersey, and they requested from Gmail a high school student's entire inbox. Right? With ProtonMail, the inbox is protected because the key is not held by ProtonMail. The key to your inbox is your password, and only you know your password. So, of course, I have my NACDL email address, and I use it proudly, and I email the world at all these different domains all day. That's my job. But if I needed to have a really private conversation that I knew was secure, I would make a ProtonMail email address, and then I will tell my friend to make a ProtonMail email address. And we will only communicate on that. ProtonMail email account to ProtonMail email account. Which means the another thing you can write down is, I'm going to download Stethoscope and install it. Next thing I'm going to do is make a ProtonMail email account. And all my clients, my new rule is all my clients, when you sign up, you get a little brochure. Hey, welcome. Thanks for you know, working with me. We're going we're gonna to get you out of this. And here's your ProtonMail email sign-up process. Go ahead and make an account and email me at this address. And then they're like, OK. And it's on them to follow the steps and email you back. You have assurances that that email cannot be read by anyone else, which you do not have with your other emails. OK? Let's move on. What's the best way to make a secure call, right? People ask me all the time. I need to, eh, easy, let's not, let's not jump the gun here. OK, so people ask me all the time. I need to make a phone call. Um, how do I do that securely? OK, let's go. I know, but I can. It throws me off. <laughs> OK. Um, Signal is an app that allows you, it's a smartphone app, to instead of using a cellular network to make your voice call, you're using a data network. And why is that important? It's important because your voice is no longer being sent from your phone to a cell tower 
to another cell tower where you're, which is closest to your friend, and then to a, a, you know, T-Mobile or some phone provider's box, and then out to where you're going, you know, the, where, to where someone picks up the phone. Your voice is being spread all over the place. With Signal, your voice is immediately encrypted from your phone itself, from the handset, and then delivered that encrypted scrambled voice to the recipient's handset, and only there, right before they hear it, is it descrambled. So no one knows what you're saying. So if I have a rule that's like, here's my number on Signal, it's a, an app you can get on a Google Play Store, and you can also download it on the Apple Store. And well, you know, in my brochure, it says, hey, thanks. Thanks for working with me. We're going to get you out of this. ProTimeMail email address, here are your steps for setting up a Signal app on your phone. It's recommended that you call me at this number using that app. Will people do that? Hopefully. But it's only if we're giving it to people can we have any hope that they're actually going to use it. And that's how you make a secure call. Next. But then people throw a curveball at Matt. They're like, hey, Matt, I learned about Signal. That's great. But what about conference calls? I'm in conferences all day. Half of my day is on conference call on speakerphone with this lawyer and that lawyer and this other person and maybe this client. And then the client's mom joins the call, right? Does Signal handle conference calls? No, Signal does not. So what do we do? All right. There is an app called Wire, W-I-R-E. And Wire is a tool that was designed by one of the founders of Skype. And uh, some people may not realize this, but Skype is not secure. So, you know, sorry to break that to you. I'll give you a mi minute to absorb that. But Skype is not very secure. And um, people can listen in on Skype calls. You don't have to listen, read Edward Snowden docs to know that. Wire, after Skype was sold and sold and sold, I think Microsoft owns Skype now, this you know, millionaire tech person said, you know what, I'm going to try to make an encrypted version of Skype. And with some people from that team, developed Wire. Wire is based out of Berlin. And what they've done is made something where you can sign up for free with an email address. And you can have a group call. And that group call is encrypted. And instead of using Uber conference or free conference call, two things that you should if you read the privacy policy, you understand or you should not be using, right? no shame, it's OK. We're going to switch to Wire. You can install Wire on your computer. If you don't have a computer, you don't have a phone, you can go to wire.com and just use that. Log in with your password and set up a conference call, and everyone's just talking through computer screens. And so Wire is pretty flexible, and that's why I love it for making an encrypted and secure conference call. All right? OK, so I've got my computer, and it seems like it's a lot more secure now. I send emails all day, but now I have assurances that these emails are private and encrypted. I make phone calls one-on-one -on -one to people, but I'm using the Signal app, which is locking it down. And no more Uber conference or free conference call for me. I'm using Wire. I feel great. But every day, I'm creating files and documents. And people are sending me files and documents. And I'm up to my eyeballs in files and documents. And they're all completely not secure. I've heard that I can lock these things down. So when someone double clicks on it, they have to enter a password. How do I do that? How do I encrypt a file or a folder? I would say. The best way to encrypt a file or folder is to use this tool called Cryptomator. Right? It's a little goofy cartoon robot. And you choose how much you want to pay. It's like a Radiohead album. right? So you can pay $0 for Cryptomator. Right? Or you can pay as much money as you want to give them, because they make a great tool. Right? When you uh, install Cryptomator, it's not the smoothest thing, but they have many YouTube videos that are made from the Cryptomator team. And they explain how you can quickly create an encrypted vault. It's like a folder on your computer that's password protected. And once you put the password in, boom, everything's available to you. But one warning I will have to tell you is you will not be able to search for files um, when they're encrypted and closed down in the vault. Right? So please practice using this stuff before you need it and understand the limitations of it. Because it's encrypted, it's basically not on your machine. So how can I find it? So that's why search doesn't work. Does that make sense? But if you have legal documents dating back for years on your one device or on an external hard drive somewhere, I recommend that you put them inside an encrypted folder. Right? And that's what Cryptomator does. All right, now I want you to take a deep breath, because I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you. 
And I want you to write down on your piece of paper some questions that you're going to ask me. We're going to have a moment where people can email questions in, and I will answer them. And that's all free of charge, right? So please take advantage of that. What's the best place to store my data? I'm storing my data on a USB drive. And I'm, even I feel that there's something intrinsically wrong about this. It's just a regular drive. It's like the size of like not even a, a I don't know, like a, a, I don't know, what's the size of a USB? It's tiny, right? I could lose that on my couch. I could drop that in court, someone could pick it up, right? So what's the best place for me to store my data? There are these new highfalutin, super cool hard drives by a company called Apricorn. Apricorn's from California in the good old US of A, not far from San Diego. And that's uh, A-P-R-I-C-O-R-N, Apricorn, right? And they make hard drives that look a lot like your external hard drive. But the biggest difference is there's a number pad on it, a lot like a phone. And when you plug in that hard drive, nothing happens until you punch in the correct code. And when you punch in the correct code, then you can access your files. If someone does not have the correct code, they cannot get in. If you punch in the correct duress code, it will erase the hard drive because there's a computer in it. So I can say, my password, it will not let you make a bad password like 1234. It won't even accept that, right? My password is one thing. My password plus 100, and then I hit unlock, is wipe this drive. So if I because somehow I need to destroy uh, what's on this drive, I have another copy of it archived on another drive safe in a safe somewhere, a physical metal safe, I could do that, right? I'm not telling you to wipe the only copy of something. I'm just saying this is how you can clean it off of this particular drive, all right? Now you notice that there's those sticks on the side there. Those are the Apricorn USB sticks. Uh, they're pretty expensive. And by pretty expensive, I mean a 16 gigabyte USB. If you go to the corner store, you go to buy one. At least my corner store sells it because I'm Matt the Hacker, right? It's like a dollar US, right? But if you want to buy a 16 gigabyte USB from Apricorn, it's like $150, right? So you can see why those USB sticks from Apricorn are a little bit, a little bit more pricey. So they're probably for the, the fancier, more starch in your collar lawyers out there, right? But the USB sticks don't need to be powered on. They have a little power inside of them. Every time you use them, they recharge. When you type in the code at any time, it'll unlock regardless of it being plugged in or not. And if you type in the duress code at any time, it'll wipe that stick, OK? So it does not need to be plugged in for it to wipe a stick. You can just wipe it by just typing in that duress code, all right? And that's the best place to store your data. You should not have a normal hard drive. The, uh, the ones that look like big external drives are pretty comparable to the price of an external drive, though. So I would recommend replacing your external drives with Apricorn drives from now on, especially um, the Apricorn drives that do not spin. They're called SSD, or solid state drives. They will last longer, OK? There's no ball bearings. There's no, if you plug your drive in and you hear zzzz, that is a drive that will die one day, all right? These drives that you want have computer chips in them. So get the ones with the computer chips in them. OK, moving on. What's the best place to store cryptocurrency? This is only for the super techie out there who are using cryptocurrency, OK? And that's with the pen and paper, OK? It's cold storage. But there's a lesson here for everyone. I'm a hacker. I can access files from anywhere on the globe, as long as there's internet. But I cannot access notebooks because I'm not a cat burglar. And I'm not going to fly over to you and try to break in and take your notebook. If there's something that really needs to be secured, I recommend, I know this sounds crazy, just write it down and lock it up. But this doesn't always work because we work and live in a digital world. And you're going to hit really serious um, blocks when you try to do everything this way. But if you're old school and you've got a big case with a little accordion style you know, briefcase with all those paper docs in there, as long as it's written down, that's great. But if it's printed files, not great. Okay. A lot of people I know out there are using Dropbox. 
Raise your hand if you're using Dropbox. I can see you. I'm looking through your webcam. OK, right, yeah. And if you're using Google Drive, oh, I see you. OK, yep, I see you too. Great. All right. All these services are not great for us to use, though. Why are not they great to use? Why don't we want to use cloud services? The reason is the cloud service doesn't know if you need this file tomorrow in India. So the cloud service makes many copies of these files and spreads them all around the world. So if that gives you pause that you're now making like a thousand of these things, maybe you should not be putting it in a cloud service, okay? Second thing about the cloud service is the cloud service will invisibly scan this, this file and match it against a database of quote unquote bad files. Now these bad files might be bomb making material, they might be uh, pictures documenting abuse and the most horrible things on the internet, but who knows, maybe another bad file might be Trump's tax returns, right? We do not know what these files are. All we know is that if you upload a file that matches one of these bad files, these hashes, a silent alarm goes off and it's a problem for you. Okay? So if you're working on a case that might involve like terrorism or national security, or even just be sensitive to a, a, a very um, strong or powerful institution or individual, I would recommend not using a regular cloud service. You want a zero knowledge cloud service, a cloud service that encrypts everything. They don't even know if your cloud is full or empty because it's just one giant metal box to them. Okay? Tresorit is such a cloud service, but I warn you, it is not cheap. Right? I think like Google Drive is something like $8 per user or something like that, while Tresorit's more like $25. But if you want good, you pay, get what you pay for. Tresorit servers are in Switzerland, just like ProtonMail. There's a little theme there. Right? And Tresorit is based in Hungary. And um, you know, all these services that I'm recommending, I've been to their offices, I've interrogated the people who work there, I've talked to their tech teams, making sure it's not someone in, on his mom's basement couch who's running the whole thing, all right? And they're really great about locking down files. So if you have to use a cloud service, use a zero knowledge one, and consider using one that's outside of US jurisdiction because they have a lot more data protections for you. What's the best way to send a file? You ever try to send a huge file and you have to end up using like uh, you send it insecurely or something like that, right? One of those services, right? So um, what's the best way to send a file to someone? Well, one is to use this thing called OnionShare. OnionShare is a free program. It's not for the technically faint at heart, but it's the best way to send a file. It encrypts the file. And it makes it so that not only uh, is the file automatically encrypted when it's sent, but there's no um, digital trail of the file being sent and where it's going. Okay, and that's the best way to send a file through Onion Share. Um, wait, let's let's go back though. Oh no, let's go let's go forward. Okay, so Onion Share is for the more technical of you out there. It's a free program you download from OnionShare.org. There's instructions on the website. You can try to use it. But with Onion Share, which we might also go back so people know what we're talking about. Um, with OnionShare, the files is being sent from my computer to my friend's computer, and only um, and they have to be online while I'm online, right? I'm literally sending it from my device to their device. There's no third party involved. That's what makes it secure, but that doesn't always work, right? What if uh, you have really slow internet, you know, and uh, you know you're in Mar-a-Lago with slow internet, and I'm here in uh, Berkeley with fast internet. And I don't want to wait for you. And I don't like this whole technical setup. What if I just want to throw it someplace? Like I did when I was using you send it insecurely. Right? So here's where you can post a file for pickup. Next one. What's the best way to post a file for pickup or download? This is something you might be more used to. Next one. And that would be our friends at Tresorit. They have a thing called send, S-E-N-D, dot Tresorit dot com. There's also a very close competitor to this product, send, S-E-N-D, dot Mozilla, dot com. The people who make Firefox. They both allow you to drag a file into your screen, password protect that, that link, right? And for free, send basically 2.5 to 5 gigabytes. And it's encrypted, and it's held on that link, and it's password protected, so they need a password to pick it up and it automatically destroys itself after a short period of time that you set. So you can say this file 
needs to be picked up. Here's the password. I'm going to send it to you. But if you don't pick it up in three days, it's not going to be there anymore. Okay? What's the best way to collaborate on documents? You might have used this thing called Google Drive. It allows you to collaborate on a document. I can be writing a Word document over here. She could be writing a Word document over here. They could be writing a Word document over there. We're all writing a Word document together. We're collaborating. But that collaboration comes at a price. It's not very secure. Right? Cryptpad, which is a tool run by a, um, a large business in France, it's kind of like a giant law firm that has like a nonprofit tech company built into it. And if you go to cryptpad.fr, C R Y P T P A D.fr, it's something that looks a lot like Google Drive. You can have a uh, basic Excel worksheet. It does not understand all formulas. So if you are a Excel mad person, right, you might be a little frustrated. But if you just need a basic Excel stuff, it's there for you. If you um, want to write, you can write uh, you know, these like, type of Word type documents that you can open files in. And you can even have your own online um, drives there for free. So if you're like, you know what, I understood that you said Tresor it's the best way. But I'm, I'm somebody who's working on trying to help people. And I'm a, a public defender. Or I have a very small uh, firm here. We can't afford Tresor it. You can just use CryptPad. Um, just make sure that when you do use CryptPad, you log out at the end of your day, especially if you have a shared computer, because it stores the password in your browser when you're using CryptPad. Okay? CryptPad is free. You can store files. You can write documents. You can send the link to people. They can write the document with you. CryptPad.fr. Lockdown, secure, and encrypted. If you're looking for that answer, here it is for you. Okay? What's the best password manager? What is a password manager anyway? A password manager is a program that manages your password. Look at that. OK, just flip it, and I got the definition. But let's look into that. Why would I even need that? And the reason is this. Your passwords are leaked on the internet. And uh, you know, if you've you know, seen some of the other stuff we talked about, like if you've gone to this website, have I been pwned, pwned.com, and you put in your email address, and you know, oh my goodness, my email's been leaked, right? It's just going to happen. Hackers are going to hack companies for money. They're going to find the passwords while they're there, and they're going to sell them on the black market to make more money, right? That's just a thing that's going to happen. So when LinkedIn gets hacked, and we read that headline, and all the passwords are leaked, or Dropbox gets hacked, and the passwords are leaked, or Adobe gets hacked, and the passwords are leaked, the password gets leaked is the common thing here. It's going to happen. So if you're not using a unique password for every website and service that you use, someone can just type in your personal email address, understand that your password is GoSox32, right? Uh, maybe you maybe you're, thought you were slicks. So you're Go, Go Red Sox 32 Adobe. And then for your Bank of America, you're Go Red Sox 32 Bank of America. Well, I'm a human being, and I can read that, and I can tell what the pattern is. So the question is, how many of my passwords will someone need to know before they can guess all my passwords? And you know, the answer is probably two, three, four, maybe five if you're trying to do a Jane Bond, James Bond type of system here. Okay? So you need to have passwords that are unique. And that would mean that you'd spend all your day making up passwords. A password manager is a program that generates crazy passwords for you so you don't need to think. You just put in one password, you get into the manager, and it generates a password for everything else. If that site gets hacked, because it will get hacked, and that password gets leaked, it's not the password that you use to log into NACDL or to log into your uh, private case load or anything like that. Okay? So hopefully I've explained why there's a need for password managers. Now I'm going to talk about what I consider the best password manager. And I would say that the best password manager is a thing called um, KeyPass XC. Because KeePass XC is not a third party. It just lives on your computer. Right? But it's not the best when it comes to ease of use. It's not the best when it's like, hey, I'm not that technical. It's also not the best when I have a bunch of laptops and a bunch of computers. For that, I got to give it to 1Password. It's always a race to me between LastPass and 1Password. But today, it's 1Password. So if you're technical, KeePass XC. It's best of breed. 
it's, a, it's free because it just, it's a free program and it just lives on your computer, right? But if you need a service that's easier to use, it's smooth, works on your phone, then you're going to use 1Password, okay? What if I needed to communicate without internet? Um, this is a pretty like niche case. It's like a really edge case out there, right? But if you needed to communicate without internet, because you'll notice the common theme here so far has been install this app on your phone, uh, install this, this, this thing on your uh, laptop or something, right? And it all involves you having internet access. If for some reason you needed to communicate without internet, like you're in a rural area, um, maybe you're concerned about the internet being safe where you are or being monitored where you are, there's a way you can do that, but it requires, um, you know, something. So let's look at that, okay? So um, if you have an Android only, you could try to install this thing called Briar. And if I have Briar installed on my Android and you have Briar installed on your Android and we're in close proximity, we don't need internet. It just uses Bluetooth and we can send messages to each other, okay? And maybe, I mean, maybe um, I don't have a VPN and I don't trust the court Wi-Fi, it's not that good, it's really slow, and I just want to communicate with someone like right next, ne next to me, right? I can install Briar and Android to Android, we can talk to each other, right? Or if I have an iPhone um, or if I have an Android, I can try to install Fire Chat. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, like, because of the way the technology works, both of these tools, the availability, I think especially on FireChat, is not easy to find. So sometimes FireChat is like, it's up and running and it's great, and other times FireChat, not so great. So um, as of my last research, FireChat was having technical problems, but it's an option. You should just try it when you don't need it. That's the key here. Not all of these are for everyone. Some of these, it's just the one question you wanted to know. Um, okay, let's move on. I don't want to beat that. Okay. And what if I wanted to communicate um, without internet, but I have some special hardware? And that's like the best way to communicate without internet, but I'm willing to pay a, a small amount of money for this. All right? And that's this thing called a Gotenna Mesh. It's a small device that you Bluetooth pair to, and it will talk to using VHF or UHF, which used to be those. Remember those antennas? Am I the only one who had those rabbit ears? Right, all right, all right, all right, don't want to age myself. So you had those, right, non-digital. It uses that technology. That's just an open band right now. So it uses that technology. I can sit anywhere within technically four miles, but because of radio interference and buildings, I would say like half a mile in an urban area. I can just talk to you without using cellular or Wi-Fi. I'm just using this thing to UHF the message to you. It's encrypted. So if we're all sitting on a bench together, we need to quickly talk to each other. Uh, we could do it that way, okay? All right. Now, this is not a particular app or tool, but it's an important thing for us to remember um, are some verification things, right? Because more and more we're using these digital services, right? and more and more we're just used to seeing avatars of our friends and colleagues, it's easy for us to end up talking to an avatar and just trusting it that it's the person that we want to be speaking to. Right? So it's, I recommend is to have some kind of like, challenge response system. And by that I mean, um, like, I might know the way that you speak. I might know some details about you. Like, oh yeah, how are the kids? Oh, how's the puppies? Great. But all those things might be also in the chat log further up. If your account was compromised or hacked or taken over, how do I know this is really you? So maybe there's just a vibe, just something I would ask you, you know, like what's your favorite soda? And it's like, oh, it's Diet Coke. I know you're addicted to those Diet Cokes, right? And then I know that it's you. Right? And it's just a method to verify that the person you're communicating with are really themselves, not a spoofed person or a bad actor. And if you work on cases that are kind of challenging those who are sitting on like seats of power, right, um, you know, then you might find yourself um, in a need of this. But I would recommend it all the time because if someone was to hack a friend's WhatsApp or a friend's Facebook Messenger or pick up someone's phone and it just was not unlocked, um, you need to know that this is that person. So I would say before you talk about anything sensitive, definitely before you talk about anything about a case, and maybe even you do verification with clients, try to have some way to prove that, hey, this is really that person. It's not their sister. It's not their aunt who might have been in the room on their computer or on their device. Okay? 
And uh, here's an example of a verification that I did. So I was using Wire, which I told you about when I was talking to some people on Wire, right? And uh, when I was using Wire, uh, someone reached out to me and said, hey, listen, we have this thing where we set up a whole help desk on Wire. We had help desk one and help desk two and help desk three as our account names. And then all of a sudden, we noticed this thing called help desk four. It's not us. We don't know who that is, right? And uh, we feel like people are using that to give bad advice. And I was like, oh, that's, there's a problem. Now you have a, a kind of fake an interloper there, like a fake account that's posing as this person, right? So what's the best way to prove that you're really this person? And how do, how do I prove that I'm really me when I talk to new people on Wire? I'm just giving you an example, okay? So what I do is I ask them to please tell me something, just give me a sentence, anything. And that person might say something like, you know, uh, the podium is brown or something like that. And then you can move on to the next slide. And then on Twitter, a totally different app, I'll just write down like the, the podium is brown, right? So you know that that's my official Twitter account. You're not sure if you're really talking to me. By looking at my official Twitter account, you see that I said that, you know that it's me, right? This can be done with any secondary channel. You could say, listen, it's the first time we're talking on this thing. I just want to call you to let you know it's really me. Or I'm just going to email you whatever that thing that you just said so you know that it's really me. All right? OK. OK, skip that. Skip that. Well, actually, no. Yeah, yeah, skip that. Um, OK, so a lot of information. We're going to take a little pause for the cause for just one second here. OK? If you have a question, Please write it down. We're hoping to field quite a few questions at the end of this thing, OK? All right, great. Um, WhatsApp is the number one messenger in the world. WhatsApp is used by many people. And a lot of people love WhatsApp because it's encrypted, meaning that um, you know, the messages that you type are scrambled, and only your recipient can read them. Move on. OK. Let's keep moving. Oh, nope, keep going. I don't know what that is. Oh, damn it, I don't have, oh, yeah, there we go. Okay, great, whoop, oh, go back. Yes, oh, wait, no. Okay, go back, wait. Go back, go back, go back. Thanks. Oh yeah, sorry. And when I say ask questions, I mean you're gonna email them to J, M, as in Mike, U, as in University, S, as in Sigma, A, as in Alpha, at NACDL.org. Of course, you know NACDL, all right? So again, that's J, M, U, S, A, at NACDL.org. Operators are standing by to receive your questions, OK? All right, so um, WhatsApp encrypts your messages. But WhatsApp also, strangely enough, backs up your messages in an unencrypted format. And uh, this is what Roger Stone learned and Paul Manafort learned the hard way. Right? When you have WhatsApp, it's very important if you use this program that you go into your settings and you turn off backups because the backups are not encrypted. I know that seems like it doesn't make any sense. But yeah, this encrypted tool makes unencrypted backups and stores them in a cloud account that can be obviously taken from, you know, uh, with a subpoena or warrant or, you know, some, you know, basic request, okay? So turn off backups on your WhatsApp. And if you're really thinking about this, I've been turned off backups on my WhatsApp because I'm like, you know what? I went to the webinar. Thank you, NACDL. I'm a good lawyer. I turned off my backups. But I'm talking to my client on WhatsApp. They got to turn off their backups because they're backing up this very conversation. So both parties, and if it's a group chat, all parties need to turn off backups. OK, next. OK, great. So how do I turn off backups? When you go to WhatsApp, on your first open it, in the upper right corner, there's a little like kind of dot, dot, dot. You go into settings. You go into chats. You go into this thing called chat backup. And uh, you could turn off the backup. You want to say, I never back up. OK? And that's how you turn it off in Android. If you have an iPhone, you're going to go to Settings. You're going to go to Chats. You're going to go to Chat Backup. 
and you're just going to make sure that the backup setting to iCloud is off. No backups to iCloud, okay? So if you happen to use WhatsApp for your legal work, for your professional life, turn off backups, because otherwise you're just creating a manuscript of everything you're typing, and you're giving it to a tech company, which might not be looking out for you or your client. All right. Okay. Another thing that you'll want to do when you're in your WhatsApp settings, you'll go back to settings, you'll go to account, you will go to security, and you will turn on security notifications. There's like a little security guard inside your WhatsApp, and he's there to tell you if anything's wrong. The security guard is living inside your iPhone, and if she notices strange, she'll tell you, but it's turned off by default. So it's like, <laughs> it's a trap, right? Turn it on so you can hear it tell you there's something wrong with this WhatsApp session, all right? Why is that turned off by default? I don't know, but let's turn it on, all right? Let's go back. Great. Now, this is a little bit more complicated, so stay with me on this, all right? If I use WhatsApp, WhatsApp can only exist on my phone. It's connected to my phone number. That's my WhatsApp, okay? I use it all the time. I went to the webinar. I turned off backups. All my clients who use WhatsApp with me, they turn off backups. It's great. One day, someone goes into their local Verizon store. They buy a phone, and they install WhatsApp on their phone. It's fine. It's their phone. They can install WhatsApp. It's their business. But WhatsApp says, hey, what's your phone number to set you up on this app called WhatsApp? And they put in your phone number. Well, that'd be weird if they did that. They put in your phone number, and then it's like, hey, um, to prove that it's really you, we're going to send you a text and just tell us what the four-digit code is. And if they somehow trick your cell phone company into sending the text to them, which I guarantee you is frighteningly easy to do, especially if you call after-hour support, right? If they guess the number correctly, they get your WhatsApp. Your WhatsApp, just like, it says WhatsApp can only live on one phone at a time. Is that okay? You're like, yeah, sure. And then all of a sudden your WhatsApp says bye-bye. And their WhatsApp wakes up and they're getting all your messages. And they're you now. All right? So how do we stop that? How do we stop that? WhatsApp has a feature, uh, a security pin feature. And they call it a two-factor. Although technically it's not two-factor, which bothers me as a nerd, but that's not your problem. Okay? So you go to settings. You'll go to WhatsApp settings, you'll turn on this two-factor, and it'll say, hey, what's your email address? Because I know you, you're going to forget this number, and you're going to get locked out of your own phone. So if you give me your email address, I'll give you a way out. So that's very nice of WhatsApp, OK? And then you'll make a PIN number, and that is your security PIN. Now you just go about your business normally. Every once in a while, if WhatsApp notices something weird, or maybe you haven't logged in in a while, it'll be like, hey, remember you made that PIN? What is it? What is the PIN number, right? And if you don't, you can't at that moment when it randomly asks you, you can't come up with the PIN, it'll lock down your WhatsApp, which is a great reassurance, right? But the best thing about it is if someone goes through that scenario again, this time they go to the T-Mobile store and they buy a T-Mobile phone and they install WhatsApp on that phone and it says, what's your phone number? But they put in your number and it says, what's the code? But somehow they know the code, right? Maybe they're sitting on your phone because you thought you lost it, right? It'll say, what's the PIN number? And there's no way for them to know, because you made it up. It lives in your mind. How's that, huh? Nice try, hackers. So turn on the security PIN on your WhatsApp, all right? And let's see how, how we're pacing on time. How are we doing on questions? I'm looking over at our, our operator who's standing by. Gives me the thumbs up. They're rolling in. Look, we, the, the questions. J-M-U-S-A at N-A-C-D-L.org. Only you can protect a lawyer's computer with these questions, okay? So just donate one, donate two questions, all right? J-M-U-S-A at N-A-C-D-L.org, okay? Um, I'm going to, we're going to test out some questions right now. Let's, okay? Let's just, because I'm really here to answer the questions. You have the slides. Anytime you, you need the slides, they're here for you, okay? But the questions, only I can answer. Okay, so there's a few questions. Yeah. I'm going to start with a couple that are just about um, sort of specific things you mentioned. 
One uh, was asking you if you could repeat the name of the easier password manager. Yes, could you speak louder though? Because I heard there's a mic problem. Okay, so we are trying to speak louder, but can you repeat the name of the easier password manager? Lawyering is hard. Password managers should be easy. I'm going to repeat the name as requested of the easier password manager. The easier password manager is the number one, and then the word password, which I hope is not your password, dot com. So that's the number one, and then P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D dot com, one password, dot com. If you happen to work for a nonprofit, you can get this thing called One Password for Democracy, which I heard is zero dollars, but shh, don't spread that, okay? So onepassword.com. The service itself is free in the beginning, but they have this really cool thing called One Password Teams. And if you work on a team with other people, it allows you to have some places for your passwords and other places for shared passwords, okay? So that is the easier password manager. Second question, what's wrong with LastPass? What's wrong with LastPass? How come you said one password? I use LastPass. What's going on with LastPass? Well, I'll tell you this. There's absolutely nothing wrong with LastPass. There's absolutely nothing wrong with Dashlane. There's absolutely nothing wrong with NPass. They're all basically the same, okay? So if there's anyone out there who's a lawyer doing legal defense for LastPass, sorry, right? But I will tell you this. Um, because I'm a security researcher, I stay up on the security news and uh, quite recently, just with a little security nerd chatter, um, Google has a thing called Project Zero, which are the Google hackers who try to protect all Google services, but also other services. And this guy, Tavis Ormandi, who works at Project Zero, did find a small mistake with LastPass, that if you use the LastPass in a browser, the, and you visit a website that knows how, how to do this, they can pull the password right through your computer into their hands. But they fixed it. So if you do use LastPass, update to the latest LastPass, okay? So if you use LastPass, update to the latest. But if you use any software, update to the latest. This story that you heard, today it was LastPass, tomorrow it's your favorite program. Update to the latest. The only reason why they update the software for free for you is because there's a security hole in it anyway. So LastPass is fine. Don't, don't leave your last pass, it's fine, okay? Uh, also, just another question about what was the website you mentioned where people can find out if their passwords have been hacked? If I, can we put a website up there? Am I, I'm going off script here. Hold on, the technicians are deliberating. I don't know if they're allowed to do this. But um, I, will, I will tell you that it's have I been, B-E-E-N, and then a little hacker slang. Instead of owned, which is hacker slang for taking over your computer, it's pwned, because P is next to O on the keyboard, and hackers love typos. So it's have I been pwned, P-W-N-E-D.com. And this website was designed by this guy, Troy Hunt, who's like me, he's a security researcher, but he works at Microsoft. And we all know that this is a problem. People's passwords are on the public internet. But he decided, well, regular people have no idea. We should have a way for them to know. And he made this website. And if you type in your, pass your email on here, you put your personal email, it'll just say, you're fine, no pwnage found. Or it'll say, oh no, you've been pwned, right? Which is more likely if you use the internet. And then it'll tell you which service had been compromised that had your email address and a password on leaked, right? Because what a hacker will do is they'll type in your password into have I been pwned, they don't actually just have a phone simplifying it, because um, we have our own ways to check. And then we'll see that your password's been leaked, and we'll just gather them and try to guess what your other ones are. Okay, so have I been pwned is great because you can see my password has been pwned, and it has like, don't panic, use a password manager, set up two factor, and it gives you all the steps to lock down your accounts. Okay, so that's have I been pwned.com. Okay, next. Is WeTransfer.com secure for sending files? Is WeTransfer secure for sending files? First of all, I should ask, does anyone work for WeTransfer out there? No. Okay, great. Because uh, remember how I said, uh, you know, you send it in securely? I was really talking about WeTransfer badly. Okay, so yeah, I would not use WeTransfer for very sensitive files. I would use send.mozilla.com. 
or send.tresserit.com. You need the reassurance that the file is not just encrypted while it's being sent, right? That's child's play. You want to know that the file is encrypted while it's on the rack waiting to be picked up. You furthermore want control that you know when the file is going to be deleted and that the file is password protected. And in the privacy policy, you want to make sure there's no funny business in there about collecting information for, about you or the person who's picking up the file. And these two that I gave you, I know that there's, that's the, the truth, okay? So does that mean that we cancel or we transfer account or anything like that? Like, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying I would use one of those two. All right, going back to WhatsApp. Is yes. WhatsApp safe? It's owned by Facebook. Well, is WhatsApp safe? It's owned by Facebook? Well, everything's owned by somebody. WhatsApp at first wasn't owned by Facebook. It was owned by this really nice guy named Brian and his co-founder. And then they sold to Facebook. And then after two years, Facebook said, hey, we want to make some small changes. And Facebook always does this when they acquire a company, did it to Instagram. We just want to add a little bit more Facebook stuff in here. And it was linking people's WhatsApps to Facebook accounts. But you could turn it off. But then, Strangely enough, Brian quit Facebook, and so did the other WhatsApp founder, and they didn't talk about it. They couldn't talk about it because if you work for Facebook, you have to sign something that says, I'm not going to get into this mess because I want a big check. But we can speculate what they were trying, why they left, because they left in a really big huff, and then Alex Stamos, who was the head of security at Facebook, also left in a big huff. I like to use products that the people who made it and designed it and spent all their lives as, like dreaming it up are still around working on that product. They didn't run away from it in a really weird way. So I try not to use WhatsApp. But let me tell you, it's the number one messenger in the world. And if you want to use an encrypted tool, the other party needs to also use that encrypted tool. So maybe it's easy to tell a colleague, let's download this weird tool. But good luck telling your clients to download a weird tool. So I would say, yeah, WhatsApp, I wouldn't recommend it. But everyone's got it. And sometimes we have to go where it's easier. If there's any friction to someone already having something, you shouldn't move them off of what they're on. Okay, again, I'll just re, you know, if you're already using something, try to use it safer rather than run to a safer tool. But at the same time, I can't recommend WhatsApp. Better than nothing, though. Better than text. Do not send a regular SMS. That's a mess. Okay, so you, you actually kind of almost asked the next question. I, uh, I hacked it. I already read your email. I think you did. Yeah. I wasn't going to say that, but thank you for saying it. Um, so understanding the importance of digital safety and privacy, uh, my clients may or may not. How do I have these conversations, and what's the best way to incentivize good practices with your clients? Thank you, whoever sent that. I'm sending you a virtual high five, OK? I care about ethics. I care about my sworn duty. I didn't just go to law school to leave my clients behind. I understand that knowing all this stuff is 50% of it. Educating my clients is the more difficult half. How can I best do that? And I'll just tell you from my experience where I've seen the best outcome. And that is, you can say, this is your client setup. Thing. Here's like a little folder you get or a brochure you get. And it's all the ways that you should be contacting me because we care about confidentiality. And it's your right to make sure that messages are only between you and I. And if you use any other way, I cannot assure you that I'm the only one who can read these messages or see these files. And that goes against everything I believe in. So, you know, and this will have a negative effect. Uh, on, on our ability to, to know that everything's fine. It does not mean that every case is going to be snooped on or, or whispered on, but these documents will live forever, and you deserve privacy. And you deserve privacy so much that I'm giving you a 10% discount. I'm just kidding, no. Uh, you deserve privacy so much that um, this is how we operate. If you send me an email that's not from ProtonMail, I'm not going to answer it. You know, If you send me a text message, because you can send it insecure, that's fine. But it's wrong of me. It's wrong of me to send insecure reply back and create an insecure stream of insecure messages. And I won't do it to you. So if you have a problem with one of these tools, call me. Obviously, that'll be insecure. Email me. Obviously, that'll be insecure. That's the only thing I'll answer you on. I'll help you. We could do this together. 
So try to do that, see if that works. Um, but I think like at the end of the day, there's a point of pain there. People are sitting in front of you because they need your assistance. And it's the best time to explain, look, I know that you don't know all this stuff. It's my job to know all this stuff. This is how we move forward. It's 2019. Okay. So I'm, I'm kind of sure you did hack my email because the next question is, why no text? Why no text messages? I'm a text message and maniac, right? Here's the issue. When you send a text message, I'm texting my client right now. Okay, I pull open my phone. Hey, so I was looking over the case and they did make that mistake. Page 32, fourth paragraph. It's a big mess and this police abuse case is blown open. We did it. And I hit send. And when I hit send, I deliver this message to a cell tower. And the cell tower says, thank you very much. And the cell tower now has not just my number, but the number of the person who I'm texting. And that cell tower stores that information for a very long time, if not forever. That information can be received by law enforcement when they do something called a tower dump, which is common. If I want to find out if uh, these two people were communicating in the range of that cell tower, I'll make a request for a tower dump, and I get all the messages between these date ranges. And I happen to be, your messages happen to be in there, the from and the to, and possibly the content. Definitely your cell phone provider, T-Mobile, Verizon, the person you call when you ask for customer support, they've got that message in plain text on their screen. They can receive that message, right? And then obviously it says because of your privacy, we won't give those messages out willy-nilly. But if it's been subpoenaed or if there's a warrant or anything like that, if you're in a case that's really strong, uh, if you're in a state that has really strong discovery laws, who knows, maybe that becomes a piece of information. Now you're creating evidence in your own case. It's really messy. So um, regular text messages are sent to cell towers. They're then sent to cell phone providers, and they're then sent in reverse to the person you sent the message to. Each of these paths, my provider, their provider, my closest cell tower, and their closest cell tower, have the information on this message. And that's why we don't want to use it. Because we like when we are the only ones and our clients are the only ones who can see these messages. Okay? But thank you. It's a great question. All right. So since we're talking about devices, so if devices like smartphones that we are using are not safe and can be used to listen in on conversations in a room, then how do they become safe when we use some of these apps on a smartphone? That's a great question. I can tell that you showed up to this webinar, like bringing the A game, and you were like, listen, earlier on you're telling me that the Google Assistant is not secure and my phone might not be secure, I should leave the phone outside. Now you're telling me I should use that phone that's not secure? Yeah, I know, it sounds crazy. So I want to rule out as many insecure things as possible. And in my work, the best way to do that is to not use that thing. Right? So if I'm in a room with you, I'm more likely to write down what I'm saying and pass you a piece of paper than ever voice it vocally, right? Yeah, OK. But sorry. But uh, I want to rule out things. So I rather forget locking down your phone or making your phone secure, or forget even worrying that someone might be listening through your phone. Let's just take the phone out of the equation, right? We don't need phones kind of like back to the future. We don't need roads, right? So if you're in a room and no phones are in that room, that's the best way to not worry about phones, OK? However, in the re it's realistic. It's 2019. People work really long hours. They're working on the weekends. We use technology every day. If you're going to use technology to send a message and not a, a bird or a pigeon or something, use encrypted technology. So to answer your question, yes, rule out technology when you can. It's the easiest way to safeguard it. If someone says, hey, hi, Matt, how do I lock down this machine? I'm like, well, maybe we just don't bring the machine, right? But if you have to use the machine, as you do, because it's 2019, let's be real, then use encrypted technology on that machine. All right, so I, I'm actually going to ask my own question. Yeah, bring it. Um, so, you know, obviously we have members who are in every kind of practice. Yes. Right? So you, maybe you're a very high-end law firm. You have money to bring in somebody to do a whole security audit, look at everything, make recommendations, you know, lock everything down to the nth degree. Maybe you're a public defender. You have no control over what programs you get to use or not use. Uh, maybe you're a solo practitioner. You know, maybe you're a nonprofit and you're just trying to figure out, like, 
you know, how do we make everything accessible to mm -hmm. everybody and try to be protective sort of in the process? So sort of thinking from the most protective of you've got money to spend, you're ready to lock everything down to, you know, we have little control and few tools, sort of how, how do people assess that range of, of what to do and how to prioritize what to do? Sure. Well, just as how your caseload looks totally different if you're a public defender or whether you're taking like a capital murder defense case and you're this giant like multinational firm, right? Your technology layout looks totally different, but there's some basic truths here. One is we want to remove technology when we can. The second is we only want to use things that are encrypted and there's two types of encryption. There's the encryption during in transit Right? Like this is sent encrypted over the internet. And that is really easy to do and really basic, and you should not be happy with that. It's just like you have to have that. Then there's a second type of encryption, which is encrypted at rest. And you need to know that this thing you're using locks down the files once it gets where it's going, and hopefully locks down the file when it's on my side of things. Okay? And um, when I talk about what's best, I've only laid out the things that would be pretty easy or universal or with a struggle possible for all those types of groups. However, if you are a large law firm, I recommend that you hire a cybersecurity awareness firm or a cybersecurity education firm. And they'll do things like send fake emails and then people will get these spam quizzes and they'll do things like people have to take these like video um, questionnaires on what is cybersecurity and how things go wrong, and then also hire an actual cybersecurity defense firm, and that would be like Mandiant Consulting or FireEye or you know these larger firms, Dragos, people like that. They'll look at all your IT stuff and they'll they'll give you quite a big bill for this, but they'll help you lock it all down. Right? When the DNC was hacked, they went to FireEye. That they and strange, you know the RNC also went to FireEye. Right? So if you have got the money, go to FireEye. I got buddies working at FireEye. There are awesome people there. You know, I have a friend at Drago. She's awesome. So there's firms that do this, but you have to do two firms. You need an education firm or an awareness firm, and you need the actual one that's going to just do the tech tools. Okay? And uh, for the public defenders out there, thank you so much for the work that you do. No offense to the others. No worries. But um, I understand you might not even have your own computer. You might have an insane caseload. You just have to... Again, the apps and the tools and the sites, they all change, but the thinking doesn't change. When I care about ethics, when I care about confidentiality, when I care about my client's privacy, that means that there's a technical element to this. And if there isn't, I need to adopt something, change my footing, even if it's just a little one inch difference to the left or right, change your footing to be more digitally safe. And just try to, it's about that intention. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Um, so, what would you recommend a private law firm use for a secretary to send messages? Oh, I didn't have my mic on. See, tech oh. problems. Okay. Um, I can repeat so the question. <laughs> so, no, but what do you recommend a private law firm for use for a secretary to send messages to the attorneys about phone calls? Yeah, I would recommend um, either using Signal, which is, you know, um, or Wire. They both also work on desktop. So Signal has a desktop version of it. So I can get a phone call. I'm on the call, and I'm already open up Signal. I have a group chat open, which are five attorneys who are working on a particular case. Boom, we just got a call in. This has been changed, better to send. And it goes out to the whole group. And I'm doing it on my desktop, right? And I have another one, which is the entire firm. Boom, hey firm, this happened. The toilets are down on the third floor. Boom, everything, right? Um, and I could either, I could use Signal or Wire to do that. When I'm deciding between the two, I might ask, well, while we're at it, do we want a free uh, conference capability of Wire um, or, or, or not? You know, like Signal, I think, is a little bit easier to set up because it's just phone numbers and boom, boom. But um, I like Wire because it also leaves less of a, less of a metadata. I don't want to get into it too much. But, when I use Signal, you, you register with your actual phone number. So if someone, for whatever reason, was able to somehow see the chat log, these phone numbers are all tied to real people. But with Wire, you're just using 
random usernames. And the chat logs are just random usernames tied to nobody, you know. So anyway, you would just use one of those two. If I was a, a executive assistant and I'm trying to support a large group of people on the, in the field and I'm wanting to get them these messages securely, that's what I would use. I also, um, I also want to talk about there's, I mean, this is a little bit more far out there, but there's encrypted, pa remember pagers, right? Doctors still use pagers. They're HIPAA compliant. They have this thing called AES encryption. And um, yeah, you can get an encrypted pager service, which I think right now there's only like one or two of. And you also could use an encrypted pager service. You have an, an app on the screen. You can send it, boom, and then the, everyone gets, if you have that much, everyone gets an uh, encrypted page, which they can also set to delete after a certain amount of time on the box. OK? Um, so that's interesting you just said that you can set to delete. Uh, speaking of ethical concerns, having these internal conversations, where are the pitfalls of setting something to automatically delete um, as you're building a case? Well, this is really sensitive here. And what we do not want is to commit a crime and destroy evidence that has to do with the case, right? But if we're not, uh, and if we work for, let's say, like we work for a corporation that has rules on you know, retention of information, if we work for inside a government agency where this stuff is the people's history, then that you should really think twice about this. But I think it just boils down to if we would have shred this when we were typing it in our typewriters, that's all these tools are doing. And if we have a policy that's applied uniformly across the board for every single thing we produce, then it's not to do with this case. That's like every firm has a data retention policy. Even if you don't have one, then it's just our data retention policy is sloppiness, right? Or maybe we hold all emails for six months and after that they're erased from the server. Long as you're following that policy and you're not making rules on the run, like as you go along, then you have some um, severance of, look, this is, this is what we're doing. We're following these things, if that makes sense, right? I'm going to mash a couple questions together because yeah. they go together-ish. When we started, you were talking about uh, you know, sort of understanding what does an infected computer look like. Yes. Um, and so sort of along those lines, what do you think are the most, I think you sort of talked about it over time, like what some of the most common digital security mistakes that are made. And what are, like if you were to give like the three places people should start, what does that look like? Sure. Okay. So. Um, on this question, it's like, what are the three common mistakes people make that get their machines infected? And the number one answer is like, you use your machine. So, um, you, if you are dealing with a like completely unsophisticated hacker, like some bored 15-year-old hacker, they're gonna send you some weird email, and it's gonna have typos in it, and they're in an internet cafe in their village or whatever, and you're gonna notice that, and you're not gonna click on anything, right? But if it's a, someone who maybe is like paid, like opposition research or some uh, uh, threat intelligence gathering firm or something like that, they're going to actually be really good at this. And they're going to like study you for a little bit and know that you like really cool necklaces. And then they're going to send you like an email from like a really cool necklace website that they created. And it's going to be like, you want a free necklace? And you're going to, OK. And then it, they're going to mail you the actual necklace. You know, If you like Nikes, it'll be like, Here's a gift code at Nike, and they paid 200 bucks for this gift code. It's real. You can go and use it as established trust. Then they will send you another one, and it's got a malware link on it. And what that link does is it takes you to a website that has the ability to scan your computer. And that, that it's scanning your computer from the web browser, looking to see if you're using old versions of anything. And if you are using old versions, this thing called a rootkit just deploys a payload that takes over the keyboard or the camera or whatever the target is, and it's game over. And it's impossible to not fall for that. There's no, I mean, there are, um, like if you have, like a, if you're a big firm, there's things you can install that will try to protect, keep links from working. If you use Outlook, for example, a lot of firms use Outlook, you can have a setting that says like, links in Outlook are stripped so they don't work, things like that, right? But, you know, there's very few protections, I think, when it comes to the uh, get infected right so you know wash your hands yeah right like you know but um you you're gonna get sick it's just about how bad will this be and um i will say this a lot of people who have windows machines use an antivirus software you should interrogate that decision 
Windows comes with a thing called um, Windows Security Center, right? And it's really good. It used to be called Windows Defender. You turn that on, it's like the best antivirus. But if you do choose an outside antivirus program, read the privacy policy. A lot of antivirus programs will say, hey, our antivirus program is going to scan your computer and let you know if something bad shows up against our database of like infection. But if we find a really enticing new weird bacteria that only exists on your machine, you give us permission to take it to the lab so everyone in the lab can play with it and look at it and figure it out what it is because people love viruses, right? But that also means that they're taking whatever it's attached to, which might be a sensitive document or an Excel sheet that no one should be looking at. So you want to read the privacy policy of all your antivirus stuff to make sure this is not the case. So, you know, I'm not going to try to throw shade on AVG or any kind of antivirus program. A lot of these companies do this because that's how they find new viruses with your help. But it also means that they can pull files. And there was a case where Kaspersky, uh, uh, you know, a very famous antivirus firm, I guess some buddies work at Kaspersky. You know, they happen to be run by this Russian computer scientist, mathematician. And, uh, and someone who worked at the NSA was trying to sell docs, and one of their docs were infected, which makes no sense. And um, Kaspersky found the infected file. It's new. It was like a new kind of thing. Took it to the lab and then noticed that it was like sensitive top secret material. They immediately backed off and like, hey, we found this. It's not our fault. But that's exactly what could happen. Not all antiviruses work this way. But you want to ask your salesperson who buys software or read it yourself whether your antivirus is actually kind of spying on your computer. You don't need it. If you have a Windows machine, use Windows Defender or Windows Security Center. If you have a Mac, there are no viruses in the wild for Mac. There's malware, which is totally different from a virus, right? And malware will take over your camera. So if you have a Mac or you have a PC, you might want a program that'll tell you if the camera's been turned on, right? Um, like for Macs, there's a, a company called um, uh, Objective. S-E-E, -E, Objective C, which is like a nerdy pun, but it's not important. And um, they make a product that'll let you know if your camera turns on. It's kind of annoying, because every time you use any kind of video chat program, it's like, hey, your camera turned on, but it will let you know if your camera turned on. So you want to start looking for, instead of stopping the infection, look for symptoms of sickness, right? Or we call them indicators of compromise. The biggest three mistakes would be you clicked on a link in a, in a message you got on your text from a WhatsApp or a regular plain text or through email. But honestly, your job is clicking on links all day. So that's kind of hard, right? The second thing that you can do to get infected is you shared a USB that was infected. Someone gave you a USB that was infected, or it's actually designed, it's not really a USB, it's a keyboard that looks like a USB. You plugged it in, and it just typed all this stuff into your um, computer. There's this thing called rubber duckies, and that's, they cost 50 bucks. That's exactly what they are. People throw them in parking lots, people pick them up, they stick it in their computer, and it's a keyboard that just dumps duh, 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 like three hours of typing in one millisecond. And just boom, you just sent everything. You didn't realize it, right? So clicking on links, sticking in weird hardware is number two. And the third way that you get in, um, hacked is social engineer, where you get hacked as a person. You receive a phone call, it's your client's number on your caller ID. Hacker parlor trick 101 is caller ID spoofing. There's no way to fix it. Caller ID is not secure. I can call you, and it can look like any number in your contacts. And guess what? The way your phone works, it shows that person's face. Totally confusing, right? You pick up, and it's me. And I'm like, <coughs> sorry, uh, did we say we're going to go with guilty or non-guilty? You know, like, you know, so, <laughs> so verification, because you will be the mistake. You're going to be tricked into talking it out or saying something or, you know, just so just verify when you're emailing someone, verify when you're chatting, even verify when you're voice calling, okay? All right, questions keep coming. Um, so let's assume when it comes to client communication, uh, the person's using Signal, a password manager, all the things you said for work-related communication. Do you then have to avoid downloading other non-secure apps on the device? Like, can you still play Angry Birds or listen to Spotify? Or yeah. Untitled Goose Game, right? Can you, did I hear you? Are you honking out there? Okay. Yeah. So, look, I'm not telling you that you have to turn your phone to the most boring phone in the universe, which is my phone, right? You, want, you love your Bitmojis? You could have your Bitmojis, right? Um, if you have an iPhone, 
apps don't normally share information with other apps that well. If you have an Android, it's a little more porous. So you should install one program that will scan every program you install and tell you if it's good or bad. And that's, uh, I recommend this one called Lookout. It's looking out for you. Lookout Security. Just install Lookout Security on your phone, and then that's it. And if you got a little money in your pocket, you could pay for the Lookout subscription. It makes it a little more powerful. But it just will tell you, like, hey, that flashlight you just installed, it's like, why is it sending network data over to the whatever, you know? Or why does it have access to your camera? That's weird. Like, Lookout will just let you know about weird stuff like that. And if you're super nerdy, right, and you have an Android phone or Windows computer, you can install this thing called GlassWire, but that's only for the super nerds out there. GlassWire also monitors all your network traffic. And I don't use it all the time. I'll just like turn it on, you know, if I'm like, okay, typical Monday, it acts like a VPN. You're giving data to GlassWire. They say they promise they're not going to use it, but malware is a real thing in a fake digital world, okay? And what do I mean by that? Like this is a thing. It has weight. It has physics. It has mass. Like I can't undo that. So if I have malware that's going to take over your computer and your computer is full, I can't put it on there. There's no space. So if you know how much space your computer uses and then all of a sudden tomorrow it's full, that's weird, right? Because malware takes up space, so that's a sign you've been infected. It's an indicator of compromise, right? So it also uses data. So GlassWire is like, hey, you use 800 megabytes of data every day. You didn't know that, but it tells you, and it shows you which apps uses it. And then all of a sudden you use one terabyte of data. That's weird. That's not normal. That's not your normal pattern. So what's going on? Oh, at 3 o'clock every day it sends everything on your phone to some random place in Saudi Arabia, right? So these are how these things work, or U United Arab Emirates. You know. Sorry, I'm just like, these are big hacking hubs. So, um, so if you really want to get technical on, on some of this stuff, look out security, easy. A little more nerdy, you could monitor things like how much memory do I normally use? How much space is free? How many apps are even on this phone? Why is there 10 more than I counted yesterday? Malware and all these spy apps and all this other stuff, they can't not apply to the normal digital rules of digital virtual physics, okay? All right, so a little bit of a turn from that. What do you think of client attorney communication portals? Uh, Rocket Matter, Clio, or My Case? Uh, I've looked at a couple of these, and again, it boils down to the, the browser is not the most secure technology in the world to begin with, right? Um, and you want to just make sure that the, the privacy policy is what you think it is, okay? There'll, there'll be some um, uh, security, like what I always look for when I'm auditing any piece of like, whether it's like a portal for messaging between clients or anything like that is, um, do they have a security email? Do they have a security page that's like, hey, did you just find a big bug in our thing? This is how you report it. Because if they don't have that, then researchers like myself have no way to tell them that there's a problem, and that's not a good thing, right? Um, do they have a bug bounty program, which is like, hey, no questions asked. If you find a hole in our product, we're just going to pay you 50 bucks or 100 bucks or gift card or whatever, right? Do they have an insurance built in. If something happens to you or your firm because of our product, we are willing to give you blah, blah, blah towards data recovery or dealing with this issue that was caused, right? And it, are all the messages encrypted and scrambled with a key that only I control or is the key on the side of the firm, right? Because these products, they, they spin them up and there's like tons of them and it changes every couple of years or whatever. But, um, those are things that I look for to just give you like a universal, I don't want to, I don't want to sit here and like, uh, we could talk about it later over coffee or whatever, but I don't want to, I don't want to talk about any particular, this company's better than that because none of them are sponsoring this webinar, okay? Are there any other questions? Uh, are we done? Oh, yeah. Why are there no viruses for Max? Matt just said there are no viruses for Max. Okay, well, there are technically viruses for Max but they're not what we would call in the wild. They're like 
viruses that someone has in a computer science lab or like it's in a university somewhere. It's not a virus like in the sense that like this thing happens on Macs. Someone wrote a program that just uses up cycles of the computer for no reason. And that is because hackers targeted where most of the people were, which were Windows machines. And even to this day, Macs are more expensive, saturation of your market, hackers are lazy. If you're going to write a tool, it only could work on one operating system. You're going to go with the one where most people are on, which is Windows or Microsoft. And historically, there was some like weird Bill Gates hacker beef thing that happened. But in today's world, Macs are based on Linux. Um, Windows is based on a, like a, a more closed structure. Macs have some things running in the background that make it harder for viruses to do what they do. And it really comes from like more of like a lazy hacker approach. But malware and viruses are two different things. And they're almost like a malware is worse. Malware is this program takes your camera information and sends it to me. This program takes your keyboard and sends it strokes and sends it to me. So I separate virus and malware because technically they're different. But to most people, they're both bad things. You know? so, but um, most antivirus programs are not anti-malware programs. And you don't need, they don't work in conjunction. Maybe you bought something that's both under one, in one box. But there is a distinction. So you don't need antivirus on a Mac. You do need something to check for malware. But if you install something like, let's say, malware bytes, which works for Mac and scans it for malware, understand that if it finds something new and weird, it might be sending it to them. So maybe you scan your computer when it's acting weird and then uninstall the malware scan, OK? Because you know, you'll forget three months from now when you're working on an important case with sensitive files that thing's running. So uninstall it when you're done. You got your results. Where do Chromebooks fall? There's a question about Chromebook. Matt loves Chromebooks. If you want a secure machine to use, use a Chromebook. Chromebooks are like really hard to hack. Like hackers understand Macs. Hackers understand Windows. Those things are designed to run programs. And if I put my program behind that program, it just tries to sneak in and run, OK? Chromebooks only run Google signed software. You cannot just fake Google signed software. Chromebooks are super secure, and every hacker has a Chromebook. It's also weirdly designed as a high school university marketing. It's like, this is for if you're going to high school or you're going to college or you need like a computer to use. But when I'm working with like investigative journalists, when I'm working with people who are, you know, have like really sensitive cases and clients, when I'm working with people who are up against crazy charges and corrupt governments, I give them Chromebooks, right? So it's, but um, there's a couple ways to use a Chromebook if you already have one. If you don't have one, just buy one. You can get one for 150 bucks. And it's almost as good as the $1,000 one. It's basically, you want one with an Intel processor if you're going to buy a Chromebook. You want one that has Google Play Store running by default so you can install Android apps, because it's, it's very limited without that. But that's most modern Chromebooks. Um, if you use this Chromebook in something called guest mode, when you just turn it on, you just go to guest mode, it gives you a very basic computer. You could use a browser. You could access any website, even ones that store files and documents. And you could use your crypt pad and all that stuff. And soon as you log out, everything is deleted and forensically unrecoverable. So guest mode is like super, super secure. Okay? As long as you're uploading all your stuff you know, to where you store it, when you log out, there's nothing to worry about when it wipes everything. Okay? If you use the normal Chromebook setup, you could install apps. But if you have... Um, a Google Suite, like your, your website's actually running Google um, behind the domain, so your email is actually like Google, like a lot of law firms. You can actually use the, go the uh, guest mode with a few tools. And it, you also can have this thing, not to get too technical, called mobile device management, where the Chrome and a lot of the information can be like one hub and deleted like one way. You know? um, if you work at a firm and they give you your own phone, that should be covered by MDM or mobile device management. IT team can be alerted that your phone is lost or stolen and wipe it in two seconds or locate it in a, in a few seconds. Um, and a Chromebook has the ability to do this. So anyway, Chromebooks, if you don't have one, I would recommend using it. If you want to open a weird email, open it on your Chromebook. It's a built-in sandbox. That thing can't be hacked. 
the hacker thinks you're running Windows, thinks you're running Mac. They don't think you're running Chrome OS. So when the malware drops, if you expose yourself to it, it doesn't go anywhere. So it gives you like a little glass box to kind of put your hands through these rubber things and incubate your way through the usage of it. So I would recommend a Chromebook for, for anyone, especially if you travel overseas across borders. It's, it's a whole other webinar, so I don't want to get into that stuff. But uh, definitely want to recommend Chromebooks. Great question. Okay. Another question. This room is alive. I'm sorry you're not here, webinar people. Oh yeah, Microsoft 365 or whatever it's called, Outlook, Outlook all that stuff. Those programs are great, okay? So um, Microsoft might buy a technology and therefore that thing's been written over like 20 years and Microsoft has certain you know, deals with certain governments and all this other stuff. So, but the, the core suite of Microsoft products is really, really good security. So, but you have to make sure that you're properly using them, which means um, are we turning off web links in content? that comes through the email. You just go into the admin 365 and turn that on, boom. Uh, do we require everyone to have two-factor to log in? So the password is not good enough. You have to use Okta or Duo Security or you know, Google Authenticator or, or you have a little fob that changes the, every 30 seconds and you put the keys in six digits. You have to be using that and turning that on. So they give you this amazing suite of tools, but you need to know which ones to use, which is basically most of them. You know, they have some that are extreme security, but a lot of, by default, it doesn't have everything turned on. So I would say when you have Office 365 or any kind of um, Outlook rollout for like you're using um, the uh, share drive thing, which I forgot what it's called, um, but you want to turn on two-factor. You want to turn on that so the passwords aren't enough to get in. You want to turn on some uh, stripping of links from content of emails. You want to turn on some basic audits, like if someone logs in from outside the US but we're a US firm, they can't get in. Um, you might want to consider, if you have one of those um, Outlook web applications, owa.mylawfirm.com, that doesn't need to be visible by everyone in the world. So maybe you say, we whitelist this page, so only these IP addresses can get in. Only people coming in from Wyoming can ever see that page. Or only people with this one static IP that's connected to our VPN that we use can see this page. Because otherwise, a hacker just has a field day, just every millisecond guessing every possible password, and boom. You know, a lot of times the number one help desk request is, "Can you unlock my account?" So they turn off locking. Just you know, after a couple of years, IT team is like, "We're turning off locking, or we're going to quit." And that's like, boom. Now it's like guess all day till you get in. So uh, leave locking on, and consider manipulating the OWA page so it's not world viewable from everywhere. Okay, people just scan for those. Yes. Well, I will tell you that they, they do do it. For example, like let's say I'm a G Suite shop, right? My law firm uses G Suite. It means that we also have advanced uh, tools available to us. So we could turn on two-factor through Google. Oh, time out. So I'm just going to say nobody hears his questions in the room. Oh, no one can he hear his question. Have, he I'm sorry. He doesn't have a mic. And also, I'm just guessing a lot of people don't know what G Suite is. Oh, they don't know what G Suite is. OK, one, should I ignore that question or should I ask it? The Repeat the question. question. I apologize. So we have a question, which is, you've gone through quite a few tools, my mind-numbing number of tools. Why is there not just one thing? I just get one place, and it has all those tools inside of it. And we all know that your average big law firm is using uh, Outlook everything or Google everything, right? So and I will say that those things, Outlook everything or Google everything, does have good things inside of it. But a lot of them are based on the uh, experience with threats that your IT team has had, right? And if they don't know about certain threats and they don't know to protect you from it, so they don't know how to turn on or why to turn on, it's not trivial to configure these things, right? Especially with the larger firms with multiple offices and locations. And that's why it's not, 
good security, it's not easy, right? Um, if you want to know if a tool is secure, the basic test is how easy is it to use? Because if it's really easy to use, it's probably not secure. And if it's impossible to use, yeah, it's the best security. But imagine you're an IT team and you have to also know a lot about these threats and configure all these things. So if you use uh, Google and you have a G Suite address, which means it looks like Gmail when you're basically in your email, there are a lot of things that the G Suite admin can do. First of all, the G Suite admin can read the subjects of every email. So if you use G Suite and you're writing a subject line, hey, important thing about your case to a client, you're sending that to the admin as well. They could search on that. So consider not writing such a beefy subject line if you use G Suite. G Suite has a lot of stuff in there. It has two-factor login. So after the password, it gives you a code. It has confidential mode, which is part of Gmail now, where you can time how long an email lasts, and then it basically erases itself. Anytime you want, you can revoke access to that email. So if you use Gmail, even free Gmail, look for the little lock with the time on it. That's confidential mode. I would recommend sending everything in confidential mode. You could, the only problem with confidential mode is people could not download those images. Uh, they can't download those files. They can view them, right? They can't forward them to someone else. But most of the time, that's all they do is read it, right? And confidential mode, you could set it to five years. Just set everything to five years, right? Anytime you want, you could revoke it with the click of a, of a button, right? It also has this thing called uh, Google Vault, which is an e-discovery platform, which you know is very little more complicated than I want to get into right now, but it's really powerful. But you need to have it all set up. Um, when you use Google Drive and you're part of a G Suite, you can set the share to expire. Most people don't realize that. You shouldn't. You have these shares that are around for five years with the people who don't work there anymore. Hacker becomes that person. They eat your lunch. They drink your milkshake. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's about that. And I, I feel like that is like a, something that's beyond a lawyer's. You know, it's like another job, right? And that's the IT team's responsibility. We have we have a webinar for IT teams. Bring your IT team bribe them with human contact or a pizza or some caffeine or whatever, and we can walk through what settings are the best settings for how they run their job. But that's getting so much in the weeds. So that's why. So uh, I say for the stuff that you could do, because at the end of the day, duty of care is on you. It's your client, not the IT teams. These are things that you should do, OK? All right. So uh, we are sort of winding down. So we are winding we down. We are. So but I'm Matt's gonna, getting wound up. I can see that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We're here to wind you up. Yeah. Um, just a couple of sort of last things on the way out. We did get a question about what is the best way to securely delete data. Ah. And then the second thing, because you sort of raised it and left it, but you know we do have attorneys who do you know travel internationally for their cases, um, and are dealing with you know we have a, a some we even have information on our website on digital searches at the border and how do you protect your information yes. and so. You know, a little bit on that I think would be really useful. Let's do it. Okay. Best way to properly delete something, if you delete a file, you're actually just hiding it. That's, you're not actually deleting it. Your computer is just like being told it could reuse the space if it needs it. So forensic recovery means I can just get that file back. But if you're using a modern computer, which means it doesn't spin up, like, zzz, you know, it doesn't have that hard drive that does that, that means it undel like like doing a permanent like government proper delete is impossible on these solid state drives. But if you full disk encrypt your computer, if you full disk encrypt, if you encrypt anything, then it's basically as good as deleted because what the person recovers is pieces of an encrypted file, an artifact as we would call it, which is not useful, especially without a password. So you want to delete something securely, encrypt it to begin with. Then when you delete the encrypted thing, it's not useful. Encrypt your entire hard drive to begin with. Then we delete regular files. It's better off. Okay. Um, second thing about if you're traveling. When it comes to border crossing, jurisdictions and particular governments and everything is really complicated. The biggest uh, solution is never travel with data you wouldn't give up. All right. If you have a Chromebook, it has something called a, a clean sweep, and it'll erase the entire Chromebook. So you clean sweep the Chromebook. You load it up with a, a username and a password and some pictures of some kittens so you can like open it up and show people there's something on it. And when you get where you're going, you go online, you go to your secure encrypted cloud service, you pull down your stuff. But when you, when you get where you're going, you get your encrypted hard drive that was like sent to you in like a tamper-proof bag over FedEx, and you put in your code and you load it up. Okay? But you never actual cross with anything important. 
which means you probably don't want to bring your normal phone because it has tons of contacts in it, okay? You want to bring a clean phone, right? Some people might call that a burner phone. You want to bring a clean computer, which I recommend Chromebooks, right? And it just has a small, simple, seeded amount of data on it, nothing sensitive. And I know that seems like a lot, but it's a big problem. If you've been away from your computer from like 10, 15 minutes, which will happen if you're a secondary or tertiary screen, no longer believe that computer's not been compromised. It's enough time to copy it, especially if it's not encrypted. So don't travel with sensitive docs. That's like, as I know it's not as hard when you, when you know the methods, the operational security, but uh, that's the answer, okay? So I am then going to just wrap us up. Um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Matt, for all of the information. This video will be on our website in the coming days, oh. nacdl.org, sure. so all that right. you can access it, go back, watch something again, share it with your friends. Um, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone.